The materials and fluids used on board a modern aircraft can be very flammable, and if they were to catch fire, it could cause a very serious problem for us whilst we're in the air. So is detecting smoke and fire just as easy as using a fire detector like I have on the roof up there? Well, let's find out, shall we? Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the final class in the AGK series where today we're going to be taking a look at smoke and fire detection systems. After this class we will be done with AGK and I will move on and do a mock exam in the following weeks so that you can use that to help me study a bit. But for now, let's have a look at how to detect fire on board an aircraft. There's no smoke without fire as they say, so we can either choose to detect smoke or fire. Smoke detection is often used in compartments like the avionics bay, cargo bays, galleys and toilets, whereas fire detection is mainly used for the engine, APU and the landing gear compartments. Smoke detection comes in two main forms. The first of these is optical detection. An optical smoke detector will be an event that has fans to draw in the air of the chosen area, like a toilet for example. Under normal circumstances, the detector has a maze-like structure inside with a light shining. The maze is not made of a reflective material, so normally the light just shines and hits dead ends. When smoke is present, the light reflects off the particles in the smoke and bounces through the maze onto a photoelectric cell, or a light detector. If the detector senses light, then a smoke alarm sounds in the cockpit. Some compartments will have a dedicated light, such as the cargo compartment and a dedicated alarm, but the toilets, for example, just sound a generic alarm, so you don't know which toilet has the smoke. It is then necessary to speak to the cabin crew to determine which toilet it is. This is done through either physically opening the door and looking in all the toilets, or some aircraft will have a panel at the front of the aircraft for the cabin crew that shows to them which alarm is going off. The other form of smoke detector is an ion detector. This is sort of the reverse of an optical sensor, I think of it. And with these detectors, uh, there's a small amount of radioactive material that reacts with the oxygen in the air to create charged ions. These charged ions allow electricity to flow from one side of the chamber to the other, which completes an electrical circuit. When there are not enough oxygen particles in the air because they've been replaced by smoke, then the circuit breaks or the current falls below a threshold which leads to the alarm going off. This is sometimes why things like deodorant might cause the smoke alarm to go off. The oxygen is replaced by the lovely smelling particles of the deodorant which breaks the circuit. And now that I look at my diagram again, I don't think I've drawn these uh, circuits correct because that's not going to complete the circuit, so therefore the alarm can't sound. But hopefully you get the point. Ignore my uh, actual electronic circuits. Just realize that when there's not current flowing, the alarm will sound. When there's current flowing, the alarm will be silent. In the engines and APU, there are lots of things that can ignite quickly, which can then run away and cause lots of problems. Things like the hot oil in the pipes, the auxiliary gearbox, any electrical controllers, any hydraulic fluid, which is why we use fire detection for the landing gear, and of course the fuel. Obviously we want the fuel to ignite, but only in the correct place in the combustion chamber. Therefore, we don't want to wait for the smoke, but instead we want to detect the heat associated with fire. The main fire detection system is made up of two loops of fire wire. When the fire wire melts in the presence of heat, it breaks a circuit and causes an alarm to sound in the cockpit. These alarms are location specific, telling you exactly where the fire is. And we use two loops of fire wire to avoid false warnings. We need both circuits to break for an alarm to sound. Overheat sensors are also used in fire detection. These are small devices that operate on the principle of heat expansion. Within a tube, we have two metallic strips normally not in contact with each other. As heat is applied, the tube expands and it stretches out and pulls the metallic strips closer and closer to each other until eventually they touch. The two metallic strips touching forms a circuit and sounds an alarm. These detectors might be used in bleed air ducts around the nozzle of the engine and in other heat sensitive areas all over the aircraft. It might not just be around the engines and the APU. 
you will likely have a combination of overheat sensors and fire warning loops on board most aircraft. Once we have detected smoke or fire, we then need to put out the fire. The simplest way we can do this is through a handheld fire extinguisher, which is what is used within the cabin where we can access the fire and fight it during the flight. For areas that we can't gain access to in flight, we need to have a built-in system. This will consist of fire suppressant balls, squibs and nozzles to spray the fluid. If we look at the engines as an example, there are two fire extinguishers that cover both engines. When a fire alarm goes off, we want to first be sure of which engine is on fire. There's been a few cases where pilots have selected the wrong engine and subsequently ruined their only working engine. So after verification of the correct engine and the correct indications showing that we have an engine fire on the left side, a fire handle can be pulled. In the A320, this is on the overhead panel, whereas on a 737, for example, it's beside the thrust levers. It's just behind the thrust levers. When the handle is pulled, let's say it's the correct handle, it's engine number one's handle, the engine first of all becomes isolated. The fuel cutoff valves are closed to stop fuel from flowing to the engine, first of all. The hydraulic cutoff valve stops any hydraulic fluid flowing to the engine driven pump and the bleed air source is cut off as well. By pulling the handle, we also arm the squibs, which are essentially just remote little switches on the fire bottles. If the fire still shows after isolating the engine, we then press a button or turn the handle to the left or right, depending on the make of aircraft, to select which squib to activate. When the squib is activated, it forces the bottle to discharge and the nozzles in the engine spray fire suppressing fluid all over the engine. If the fire warning still shows after that first bottle is discharged, we then select the other squib to activate and the other bottle gets discharged. Hopefully after two goes of the uh, fire suppressant fluid, the fire goes out. But if it doesn't, then we have an uncontrollable fire that could quickly get out of control and we would need to land as soon as we possibly could. It is important to note that there's only two bottles, not two per engine, and the bottles can be used uh, either both on one or one on each, but there's no point in saving one just in case the other engine goes on fire because you want the immediate fire dealt with rather than potentially saving a bottle in case of another fire down the road. The odds of two engines going on fire are very, very minimal. So you want to deal with the problem that you have first rather than waiting and predicting a problem that might come. A similar bottle and squib system will be used in the cargo bay and landing gear compartment as well. You might have uh, the option to select nozzles in the front or the rear uh, holds to spray the fluid on and suppress any fire that might be present in the cargo bays and the landing, landing gear compartment as well. To summarize then, smoke detectors can be optical. In normal conditions, the light in the optical sensor just bounces off the uh, maze-like structure inside and doesn't reach the photoelectric cell. When there's smoke present, the particles in the smoke reflect this light and the light reaches the photoelectric cell. And if the photoelectric cell has light on it, it, shine, it shines and um, it sounds an alarm in the cockpit. The other type of smoke detector is an ion uh, smoke detector. There's a small amount of radioactive material within the smoke detector and in normal conditions, this reacts with the oxygen in the air to create ions. These ions conduct electricity and allow a circuit and electricity to flow. If there's not enough oxygen because it's been replaced by smoke, then the current is uh, lower or it might even stop completely. And if the circuit breaks or if the current drops below a certain threshold, that's when the alarm sounds. So this one you need to um, so I think of them as almost being opposite. This you're sort of breaking a circuit, whereas this you're making a light circuit. Um, I don't know why that's in my head, but that's the way that I've remembered it. So that's smoke detection. We've also got fire detection, or more specifically heat detection. We want to use fire detection for areas where um, any overheat conditions can lead to a fire uh, running away quite quickly. So we're thinking of engines uh, primarily and maybe also things like the landing gear, hydraulic fluid, that sort of thing. So the first uh, system is what we call the fire loop system. You've got two loops of fire wire. 
and uh, if the temperature gets too hot next to them, they melt, break the circuit. You need both of them to break to stop any spurious warnings. And then if both of the loops of wire are broken, then we get an alarm sounding. We also have overheat detectors that we can use as well. They can be dotted around the engine in various locations or maybe in the bleed ducts, uh, the wing anti-ice system, things like that uh, might have an overheat detector. And this works on the principle of thermal expansion. You've got a tube with two metallic strips in it. As the temperature increases, the tube stretches out and it sort of pulls these metallic strips together. Once that connection is made, it completes a circuit and sounds an alarm. To fight the fire, the most basic thing you can do is if you can get access to the fire, you just use a portable fire extinguisher. They're dotted around the cabin in various locations and there's also one in the flight deck just to fight fire if you can get access to it. If you can't get access to it, you need to use a remote system, um, typically consisting of some fire bottles with squibs, sort of automatic switches, and the nozzles to spray the fluid. So again, if we have a fire in the engine, we first isolate the engine by pulling the fire handle, then we select which squib we want to fire, um, want to fire, want to activate onto the fire. I can't say fire and fire, that would be a bit confusing. So yeah, we select which squib we want to activate to suppress the fire. That will cause uh, the fire suppressing fluid to be drawn from the bottle and sprayed over the engine. If that doesn't work, we then select the other squib to be activated which then selects the other bottle to discharge over the uh, fire and put it out. And two bottles doesn't mean that there's two per engine, it's just two for the whole um, or for both engines. And you can either do one in each or both in one, or uh, hopefully none in neither when you don't have a fire. Um, and that's pretty much it.